Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. I am truly struck with how many of the hymns speak of that wonderful, blessed place to which, by the grace of God, each of us will go, those of us who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ for our salvation. Today the message is entitled, Foundation for a New Beginning. Foundation for a New Beginning. It's been a long time since we were in the book of Exodus, and I <laughs> think you'll probably recognize that. We had Palm Sunday, and then we had Resurrection Sunday, and then we had Missionary Weekend, and so... Uh, it has been a few weeks since we were over there. Today we're looking at verses 27 through 31. I'll read those again for us. The Lord said unto Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went and met him in the mount of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses and did all the signs in the sight of the people. And then the next verse, which is so critical, and the people believed. And when they had heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel, and that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshiped. Let's join together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the response that those who believe have when they understand that you, the gracious God of heaven, have heard their affliction and you have sent deliverance. They worshiped. They bowed their heads. Oh, Father, what a privilege that is to know that you are the God who hears us who answers our prayers and it makes us fall at your feet to worship you. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the last time we were together, we looked at divinely appointed meetings, the first half, and we learned nine different lessons at that time. I'm going to review them quickly because it's been, this will be the fourth week since we studied that. Lesson number one, God can talk to more than one person at a time. Of course, that's an obvious, simultaneous communication through his word to millions of people worldwide without the confusion of crosstalk, as you sometimes get on your radio. And I think that's an illustration of God's omniscience and omnipresence. That means that while he is speaking to you, he can at the same time be directing someone else to have a significant intersection in your life. Number two, and we're going to see more of that today, the Lord willing. Number two, God is not obligated to anyone except to his own word. God never violates his own word. Do not expect God to do something that is contrary to his word. And he can choose whom he wishes to use, when he wishes to use them, and he can do it without our input. The third lesson we learned was God can precisely time his interacting with his people, to perfectly coordinate events. I've recently seen that in many different things, which I'll be sharing with you a little bit later, the Lord willing. Number four lesson, God can give specific direction even when his commands appear to be general in nature. Let me say that again. God can give specific direction even when his commands appear to be general. Very important lesson for us to learn because it will help us overcome our reluctance to obey what we know. Lesson number five. Some people obey more readily at the beginning but then later fail. We saw that with Aaron. And some people are resistant to the command of God in their lives but later repent and prove that God's choices were right all along. For example, Moses. And of course, we looked at the illustration that our Lord Jesus Christ gave of the father who had two sons and he said to one go and work in the fields and the son said I go but that he didn't go and then he said to the second one go and he said I won't but later he went 
God knows the end results when he gives his commands. What we want to be are the people who say yes and then do, not the people who say yes and don't. And although it's better not even to be the people who say I won't and then end up doing, what we need to learn to do is obey when God gives the command. Lesson number six. This I think is very important. God has strategic locations for bringing his people together at precisely the right time. It is no accident that you are here in this church. It is no accident that you are here today. It is no accident that tomorrow you will be in a certain location at a certain time when certain people come across your path. It is no accident that six days from now you will be in a specific location and someone that you perhaps have never met before will come across your path. God has strategic locations for bringing his people together at precisely the right times. In our text we had seen the phrase, the Mount of God. That's a reference to Mount Sinai. It was also known as Mount Horeb. Those are all the same place. When Moses leads the children of Israel through the wilderness, he's been there before. Notice also, that place was called the Mount of God. And that was the place where God met Moses at the burning bush. There are certain key intersections where many things take place. Out here is the corner of Haddon Avenue and Cuthbert. And there are four different things on four different corners. And at one time you might be going to the Krispy Kreme Donut. And at one time you might be going to the pharmacy. And at one time you might be going to the Walmart. And at one time you might be coming here. Same corner, many different activities taking place. 20,000 people per day cross that intersection one way or the other. There are intersections in your life and some of them are more important and strategic than others in a specific direction that God wants your path to go. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. God often makes himself known to us in obscure places. He surprises us in places we would not expect to find him. Be alert for that, otherwise you may miss it. In Exodus 3.1, it's called the backside of the desert. In Exodus 4, God says, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. God met Moses unexpectedly. But God did something different with Aaron. God sent Aaron to a very odd and seemingly irrational journey. God makes the intersections in our lives in different ways. Those are different forms of contact by God, different locations, but precisely tailored to accomplish the precise will of God. We need to learn not to think of God as a machine. We need to learn not to think about God to work exactly the same way as he always did in our life before when we're looking at the lives of other people. Lesson number seven. We saw last week the text pointed out that Moses and Aaron kissed one another when they met. They were brothers that had not seen each other in 40 years. I look back 40 years ago and I think, you know, what people have I not seen in 40 years? There are a lot of them. There are a lot of people I've not seen in 40 years. And here are two brothers who loved one another. And the older brother is coming from Egypt and Moses, the younger brother, is out in the desert. And in the sovereign hand of God, God brought them together again. Number eight, they were obviously very happy to see one another, but remember, in the midst of your euphoria, be careful that you carry the precise message that God has given to you. Verse 28 tells us, Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. Moses had gotten the point by now, 
And Moses wanted to make sure that he communicated precisely what God wanted him to communicate. And then lesson nine, which was the place we ended last time, make sure you do exactly what God has commanded you to do. Don't do something else. Don't do something less. Don't do something extra. Do what God called you to do. Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And now that brings us to the new material for today as we move down to verses 30 and 31. Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses and did all the signs in the sight of the people. They've gathered the elders. They've gathered the children of Israel. God has told Moses, you're going to be the one who is the prophet, but Aaron is going to be your spokesman. And so Aaron is telling the people exactly what Moses has told him and doing those signs in front of the children of Israel. And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked upon their affliction. Dear people, where do you hurt? These are some very precious verses for me as I was studying for this message. The people believed when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and they had looked upon their affliction. Then they bowed their heads and worshiped. When you go through the hard times, do you know there is a God who has looked upon your affliction? Does it cause you to believe? Does it cause you to bow your head and worship? Oh, dear friends, I hope it does. That is the right response when you're faced with the crisis of life. But we have some other lessons to learn here. Number one, always be prepared to move quickly and to obey when God gives direction. They did it. They went. They called the elders. And what an incredible result they got. Your immediate response is necessary to make the intersections in the lives of others so that God will move his plan forward. You know, if you were with us in the evening services, we saw an amazing illustration of that in the life of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. So today what I want to do is compare how God worked in the life of Moses to how God worked in the life of Philip, whom we've already studied. So those of you who heard those messages will begin to click. It'll begin to click as we move through the life of Moses here and look at these precise events that took place with Moses and what God did in a very, very similar way with Philip. It also shows a pattern, though not everything is identical. It shows you a pattern of how God works in our lives as he brings our lives into intersection with the lives of others whom he is going to reach. It's a magnificent thought as we look at it. As we look at the book of Acts, we see the book of Acts, first the contrast between Acts and Exodus. As we look at the book of Acts, we see that Acts is a book of transition. In the first two chapters, we see the gospel going first to Jewish men. That's on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 Jewish men. It uses the technical term for males, there in Acts chapter 2, are drawn to Christ as the gospel is proclaimed. We move further into the book, into Acts chapter 8, and we find the gospel going to people who are half Jew and half Gentile, and it includes both men and women. That's the Samaritans. As we get to the end of Acts chapter 8, we see the gospel going to a eunuch, who is a Gentile by birth, but Jewish by religion, and because he's a eunuch, neither male nor female. It's a transition that's going on, a spreading out that's going on at this point. And by the time we get to Acts chapter 10, we find the gospel going to Gentiles, not merely Gentiles, but Romans, the Romans who were oppressing Israel. There's a transition going on. 
The Gospel went from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. The book of Acts is a book of transition from law to grace. It's a book of transition from national Israel to the church. Transition. That's the same as the book of Exodus. It's also a book of transition. It goes from a people dormant. They had been sitting around for 400 years enjoying Egypt. Did you know when God's people don't do what God wants them to do, that he sends trouble? God gave Israel 400 years. Now they knew that God had given a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob, and it related to a land, it related to a location, it related to a place where God wanted them to be, to fulfill a specific purpose, to be a light to the nations. But they got complacent. They got too much of the good life. They began to enjoy it too much, the leeks and the lentils and the barley and the garlic. Oh, the garlic <laughs> of Egypt. And they began to be sat, fat and sassy and lazy. And so God raised up a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. Does it sound like our country? Christians came to this country zealous for Christ. Zealous not merely to conquer a new land and gain gold, but though there were those who did that, but zealous to serve Christ and to worship freely and to proclaim the gospel to those who had not heard. We become fat and lazy and indolent, slothful, covetous, foolish. Our eyes have turned from God. Remember what happens to a people when they do that. When the people of God forget what God has told them they are supposed to be doing. So the book of Exodus is a book of transition. It goes from a people dormant to a people oppressed. And then to a people greatly oppressed. And then it brings us to a people repentant. And then it brings us to a people who understand they are a people chosen to a people who believe, as we see in our verse today, to a people delivered, to a people with whom God makes a covenant. It goes from a people without the law to a people with the law. It goes from a people willing to believe in order to be delivered to a people in fear and disbelief when deliverance takes time. To a people trembling before God at Mount Sinai. To a people then in rebellion and disbelief in the wilderness. To a people under judgment in the wilderness. To the brink of the Jordan River. And pending victory. These are books of transition. And so we find Philip in Acts and we find Moses and Aaron in Exodus, and we're going to see some things that parallel very much in the lives of these men. Throughout all of this, we've seen the moving hand of God. In Acts chapter 8, verse 25, explains that when the hand of God begins to move in transition, three things happen. The hand of God will always affect three things. Time, location, people. First, when God begins to move in those three areas, he will begin to close down certain things. Hear it carefully. When God begins to move in those areas, he begins to close down certain things. Philip's evangelistic revival was over. It was great while it was going on. It was powerful while it was going on. People were coming to Christ while it was going on. There was excitement in the church. There was spiritual growth. But God closed it down. In the same way, 
Moses' sheep days were over. Moses had a family. Moses had a job. Moses had a, a life where nobody was giving him grief. Moses had what he wanted. Moses had a really good father-in-law. Moses had a father-in-law who had a position of authority. Moses had everything that he could want because he was tired of that stuff in Egypt. And he really didn't want to go back. But God closed down Moses' sheep days. God moved both of these men into new service in clear and direct ways. Historically, God does three things when he wants to make an impact through revival or work in a special way with his elect. And notice well, he uses people that we would not use. So let's talk about those three ways. Number one, the time. When God chooses, he chooses when he will send his spirit to bring revival. He opens the revival in his time. He closes the revival in his time. But always, his time is limited. The Spirit of God moves for a definitive period of time and then sovereignly chooses to close down the revival when the specific group of his elect have responded to the call of God. There was a limited time that Moses would be in Egypt before the Exodus, a limited time for the Egyptians to repent and to trust the living God. Let's talk about the location. God chooses unlikely places in which he will move his hand. In Acts 8.25, it was Samaria. But looking at church history, we discover major revivals in Wales with the Great Welsh Revival. <laughs> How much do you know about the Great Welsh Revival? It was a powerful time in history. Do you even know where Wales is located? Well, you say it's over in the British Isles somewhere, right? Okay. <laughs> There was an incredible revival in Wales. Then there was the first great awakening, 1740 and 1741, in the times of George Whitfield, Gilbert Tennant, Jonathan Edwards. Then the second great awakening in the 1790s, giving birth to many missionary societies, the founding of many Christian academies, colleges, and theological seminaries. There was the great Kentucky revival in the early 1800s. Do you know anything about the Great Kentucky Revival? Did you know that it was brought about by the preaching of Presbyterian ministers? Did you know that that was the beginning of the camp meeting movement and mass gatherings for hundreds of miles around where people came literally from hundreds of miles to celebrate the Lord's table together? That was the Great Kentucky Revival. There were major revivals in the Confederate Army during the war between the states. Now up here you probably don't hear about those. But there were really tremendous, incredible revivals in the South during the Civil War. There were corresponding revivals in the Union Army. There were further revivals at the end of the 1800s and early 1900s, and this is just considering a few revivals in the United States and in scattered locations in both the North and the South. But there have been Revivals, God chose the time and the place in the British Isles, in Scandinavia. What do you know about the Scandinavian revivals? <laughs> Judy was half Swedish and half Norwegian. <laughs> I've heard some of this. Revivals in Africa, in India, in China under Hudson Taylor and others. The New Hebrides with Presbyterian John Patton and many others as well. Are you deaf and blind? what the Spirit of God does when he chooses to move and then when he chooses to close. The Spirit of God is sovereign in the location in which revival occurs. Third, the people and this is so interesting because God chooses people that we probably wouldn't choose if we were busy choosing them. We'd probably only choose strict fundamentalist Presbyterians. 
But you know, there were Methodist revivals led by the Wesley brothers, who are Arminians. There were revivals led by George Whitfield, who was a predestinarian. There were Baptists of both persuasions. In the 1770s, there was a great revival under the preaching of an Anglican churchman, Devereux Gerat. Civil War revivals were led by both Arminian preachers and Calvinists. As the years passed, the United States saw great revivals under Dwight L. Moody, Ira Sankey, Billy Sunday, and Charles Finney, who was wildly Arminian. God's hand moved on both Arminians and predestinarians, though at times they bitterly and still do oppose each other. But God is sovereign in salvation, even though the Arminians don't believe that. God is sovereign in salvation and uses whom he will in spite of our thoughts that he should do things differently. Dear people, I suspect that if you and I were choosing somebody to go down to Egypt, we probably wouldn't have chosen Moses. He was a washed up has-been. He was a man who ran away on charges of murder. He was a man who had basically sat rusting out in the desert for 40 years. He was 80 years old when he got called to go. You wouldn't have chosen him. I wouldn't have chosen him. God chose him because God is the one who gets the glory, because God is the one who empowers. Conclusion. The point, I think, is clear. God opened the revival in Samaria. God closed the revival in Samaria. God presented his word with power in Egypt. God slammed the door shut with power by drowning Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. God sent his ambassadors to other works. We should not be surprised when an era passes in which God was doing a special work in a special location at a special time with a special people. He can change what he's doing at any time. We need to understand that that's true for this church, Bible Presbyterian Church of Collingswood. Just as it has been throughout the history of the sovereign plan of God. He's not obligated to continue doing the same things the way that we expect or the way that we require. He calls. He gifts. He sends people whom we consider great men at crucial points in history when key battles must be won. He gives them courage. He gives them strength to do his will. And then he calls them home. He does not always choose to keep a battlefront open with troops moving forward. He uses divine strategy in the heavenly war against evil. He chooses which captives to release from Satan's clutches, and he leaves others alone. Like Moses and Aaron, God sent Philip to the desert. Often what we consider big successes are followed later by what we would call downsizing. However, the downsizing for Philip opened an even greater ministry than the Samaritan revival and a new ministry historically that affected the entire nation of Ethiopia for centuries. Plus, it opened up 19 years of very successful church planning. We'll be talking about that in the book of Acts when we get a little bit farther along. We discover that it took Philip 19 years to go about 50 miles. And my, what he was doing in the meantime. Join us on Sunday evenings. Successful church planning. The desert contacts with Moses and Aaron opened up the entire national history of Old Testament Israel. Yeah, they moved out of Egypt. They went through a lot of trouble. But that's where we open most of the Old Testament history. Acts 8, 26 says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Now, we need to understand something. That's not burnout. It was not a matter of burnout. Elijah experienced burnout after his contest with the prophets of Baal, his run to Jezreel ahead of Ahab's chariot, and the threat from Jezebel. It wasn't burnout that Philip had. It wasn't burnout that Moses experienced. Number two, it was not a matter of self-will. Like Samson, 
who was out of fellowship and thought he would just get up and leave after his hair got cut by Delilah. It wasn't self-will that Philip had going south. It wasn't self-will that Moses had going to Egypt. Number three, it was not a matter of boredom and seeking another ministry. Church hopping preachers average about two to three years in a ministry, which is the majority of preachers. Number four, it was not a matter of running from a fight. The battle had been won at Samaria for Philip and God sent him to another campaign. The battle was just about to begin for Moses, so it's not a matter of running from the fight. That brings us to lesson number two for today. That raises the question of divine direction. As we compare Moses and Philip and we look at the way in which God gave them divine direction, both Moses and Philip, and we might add Aaron also, had an audible, articulate, supernatural manifestation. And remember, with Philip, that's still during the apostolic period when new special revelation was being given. That's not going to happen to you today. That is not the standard for today. And I hope you were with us when we talked about the, the different spiritual gifts, 21 different spiritual gifts, 22. We spent 14 weeks on the spiritual gifts. So what does God use today to give divine direction? Because they're getting divine direction. It's clear divine direction. It's divine direction that has results. So what do we use today to give, to get divine direction? Number one, the scriptures. God never calls you to do something contrary to his will revealed in his word. Psalm 119. Let me read just a few verses out of it. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word. The scriptures give divine direction. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee, O let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God. The first source of divine direction is the word of God. That can be broken down into very systematic, practical questions. If you've been with us on Sunday evening, and I hope you do, how do you use the Bible to determine the will of God? We covered these things in detail, but I'll run through them quickly. How do you use the Bible to determine the will of God? Ask yourself some questions. Number one, is it commanded? You must do it. Number two, is it prohibited? You may not do it. Is there a general principle stated? Learn what it is and apply it. Does it cause a weaker brother to stumble? Avoid it. Does it glorify God in a positive manner? Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Everything you do every day must be to the glory of God. Did you know that? Not just the big things. Everything. Do all to the glory of God. Number five. Does it dim my testimony to the lost world, even though it's permissible in the strictest sense? How does it affect your testimony to unsaved people around you? The word of God will tell you that. Does it edify or build up the church? We're supposed to be do all things unto edification. Does this choice that you make, as it reflects the scripture, build up the body of Christ? Is it an appropriate use of the gifts that I've been given? Or am I trying to exercise a responsibility or gift that I don't have? Or in the wrong way, for my own glory? The scripture gives your first line of direction. Second, this is the one that especially young people don't like to hear. The second source of divine direction is your parents. That's the second major source of direction that God has provided. Let me read you just a few verses. Proverbs 1.8, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. It will give you beauty and it will give you restraint. An ornament of grace, a chain around your neck. Chapter 6, verse 20. My son, keep thy father's commandments. Forsake not the law of thy mother. Proverbs 23, 22. Hearken unto thy father that begat thee and despise not thy mother when she is old. You know, they still have something to say. 
even after they passed that magic mark of 39. Proverbs 30:17. The eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out, the young eagles shall eat it. Third source of divine direction is prayer. Carefully listen to this, not merely prayer. Oh God, I want this. Prayer with the desire to know and do the will of God. Let me say it again. Prayer with the desire to know and do the will of God. It's not prayer with our own predetermined choices looking for God's stamp of approval. Remember our study on the will of God. God wants us to know and do his will more than we want to know and do his will. He wants you to know it more than you want to know it. No matter how badly you want to know the will of God, God has a greater desire for you to know his will and to do it than you have to do it. Because all of us are tainted by the flesh. Let me give you just a few verses. Deuteronomy 4.29 But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Do you want to know the will of God? Are you seeking him with all your heart? Are you seeking him with all your soul? First Chronicles 22.19 now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. Arise, therefore, and build ye the sanctuary of the Lord God, to bring the ark of the covenant to the Lord and the holy vessels of God into the house that is to be built to the name of God. They had a command. They had to obey, but it's not merely obeying the command to build. It was first to seek. Set their hearts and souls to seek the Lord. Your God. Second Chronicles 11:16, and after them, out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice unto the Lord God of their fathers. Your heart has to be right if you would bring a sacrifice acceptable to God, not merely a perfunctory service that you do because it's an obligation and other people are watching. Or because, well, you sort of were raised that way. You want an acceptable sacrifice? You first must set your heart to seek the Lord God. Here's the condemnation of one of the evil kings. In chapter 12, verse 14, he did evil because. Listen, he did evil because. He prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. Prayer. Prayer with the desire, the fervent desire, to seek, to know, to do the will of God. If you don't, you know what will result? You will do evil because you prepared not your heart to seek the Lord. Chapter 15, verse 12, they entered into covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul. Have you made a covenant with God that way? I hope you have. They made a covenant with the Lord to seek him with all their heart and with all their soul. Have you made that commitment? I hope you have. How else will you be motivated if that is not your desire. Second Chronicles 20, Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. Psalm 34:10, The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Isaiah 65, 24, And it shall come to pass that before I call, they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. God wants to hear and answer your prayers. Do you seek him with all your heart? With all your soul? Do you desire his will more than anything else? Even when it's difficult, even when it's painful? Do you want the will of God? 
That's the way God gives direction. If, if it's not your own predetermined will that's looking for God's stamp of approval. Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Hebrews 4, 16, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You can come boldly because you, as a believer, are in Christ. Fourth, the fourth source of divine direction. Godly pastors and men of God who are spiritual mentors. Hebrews 13, 7. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. What does their manner of life lead to? There are fakes out there. The manner of their life leads to lasciviousness. There are the false teachers out there. The end of their life leads to covetousness and greed. Consider the end of their life. What are the results that are produced by the things that that man believes and teaches? Remember them which have the rule over you who have spoken unto you the word of God whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Ten verses later in verse 17, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that is unprofitable for you. There are obviously other things and others whom you may consult, but normally you'll receive your answer clearly when you use those first four points of determination. And please, friends, don't say, well, I'd like to go to the other ones first before I try those four out. Don't ignore those and go to your friends, your emotions, or to your shrink first. Start with the scriptures. Conclusion to that. You will not have a special angelic messenger speak God's will to you audibly. However, you can definitely know the will of God by applying these principles. Again, God wants you to know and do his will more than you want to know and do his will. If you really want to know his will and apply the above principles, he will definitely help you to know and do his will and he will give you the power to do it. Lesson number three. The third thing that we notice with both Philip and Moses' Aaron team is that God did not give all of his instruction at once. God doesn't give all of his instructions at once. He expects us to take one step at a time. He doesn't rocket us to the moon or transport us from the spaceship out there uh, down to earth. He gives us directions one step at a time and he expects us to obey each step of the way. Look at Acts 8.26, comparing it now with Exodus. The angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go down toward the south, into the way that goeth down from Jerusalem into Gaza, which is desert. With Moses and Aaron, God did the same kind of thing. They did not know anything about the ten plagues until each plague was revealed. God merely told them to go. But you know, I think most of us have a problem with this lesson number three, which is God doesn't give all the information in advance. Our problem is, if we receive that kind of instruction, we probably want a little more definitive details before we obey. But you know that's the wrong response. We need to learn to immediately obey the light that we are given or else we will not get any more light. Philip was merely told to go south from Samaria. Aaron was just told to go into the wilderness. And you know, folks, that's pretty vague. <laughs> if you're starting in Egypt, there's a lot of wilderness that's around you. Philip was told to generally go on a road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza. He was not specifically told where to intersect that road. He was not told whether to go first to Jerusalem and get on the road and then head toward Gaza. He was not told whether or not to go toward Gaza and intersect the road at a specific point. Samaria is north and east. Jerusalem is south of Samaria and east. Gaza is even further south and west on the coast. 
You know, there are a lot of different alternative routes that he could have taken that Aaron could certainly have taken as he was going to find Moses. He had less of an idea. It's a pretty big wilderness in every direction when you start in Egypt. So when God calls us to do something, there are usually several alter alternative routes that we can take to get to the point of appointment. For example, God is working in each one of your lives. Perhaps you know, through the process that we've talked about a moment ago, that God has called you to be a missionary in Argentina. Now there are many Bible schools or colleges at which you could prepare. There are several missionary agencies that have or are having, planning to have, ministries in Argentina. Some preparation takes longer than other preparation depending on the type of ministry that you know God has called you to perform. To be a missionary teacher takes less years to prepare than preparing to be a missionary seminary professor. But as you walk by faith, God is going to open certain doors and close others. I see that in my life as I look back over and over and over. Last night we had the privilege of going with Paul and Paul and Cheryl Durand uh, out to um, a place to eat. We talked about how God had been working in our lives with different things, giving direction, making changes to our own personal plans and, and things that God was doing. I look back and I see thousands of instances where God gave that kind of clear direction. As you walk by faith, God opens certain doors. God closes others. Philip knew that he had to get onto the Jerusalem-Gaza highway, but God didn't tell him where to get on. God just told Aaron to start walking into the wilderness. But listen carefully. This, I think, is a very important lesson. We need to learn it. Today may be farther down the road than we wanted to be, but we should learn it at least today. Don't wait until tomorrow to learn it. Remember, the sovereign hand of God overshadows history. The sovereign hand of God overshadows the man, the woman, the boy, the girl. Here's the key whose heart desires to be in the center of his will. God will make sure that you arrive at the destination he has chosen. Here, I mean, he's going to make sure you get there, but here's the key phrase. By the best possible path. Jonah got to where he was supposed to go. It was not the most pleasant journey. Jonah had to take a detour through a humongous storm and then the belly of a great fish and get covered with fish vomit on the shore before he finally went to Nineveh. God got him there and God will get you where he wants you to go. But God will get you to the destination by the best possible path if your heart desires to be in the center of his will. If you walk in obedient faith every step of the way. Read the, bullet, the front cover of your bulletin today, that beautiful butterfly that's on there. That bulletin cover, Psalm 37, verse 4. As you delight yourself in the Lord, he will first mold your desires to be his desires. Oh, how important that is. We like to focus on he will give you the desires of your heart. It's the last half of the verse. Read the first half of the verse. As you delight yourself in the Lord, he will mold your desires to be his desires, and then he will give you the desires of your heart. He's not going to give you your wicked, carnal desires. The key is the first that we must delight ourselves in the Lord. That means that you want his desires in your life more than anything else. And then when he gives those desires to you, it will fill your heart with joy and gladness and not with gravel, not with bitterness, not with sorrow. Regardless of circumstances, it will fill your heart with joy and gladness. There's a caveat. God did tell both Philip and the Moses Aaron team to get moving. As Philip was in Samaria, there was a certain man on his way to Jerusalem. He was going to be there for a specific period of time. 
He was traveling at a specific rate of speed. He was resting in certain locations. He was stopping to eat for specific lengths of time and then returning home. History moves along. You're in the middle of history. It's moving. God had planned a divine appointment where he would intersect with Philip at precisely the time when he was doing, that is the Ethiopian eunuch, when the Ethiopian eunuch was doing a very specific activity. <laughs> he was reading the Old Testament aloud. He wasn't reading it silently to himself. He was reading it aloud. He was reading it in Hebrew because as Philip came up alongside the chariot, he heard him reading. And he understood what he was reading. And he said, hey, do you understand what you're reading? And the guy said, no, how can I? Unless somebody explains it to me. He was reading a very specific chapter. He was reading a very specific verse that would be absolutely the very best open door for Philip to walk through. The point is, when you know God has called you to do some act of service or to have some specific interaction with some specific person, don't sit on your hands wondering and fretting about it. Get moving. Number six, God did not let Philip stop in Jerusalem. You know, that would have been so easy. Philip could have chosen that route. And it would have been easy to stop in Jerusalem. That was the capital city. That was the place of most convenience. That was the place with the biggest church. That was the place to give an exciting missionary port. That was the place for fellowship. That was the place for further personal growth. That was the place for recreation and relaxation. In other words, it was the place where he would be tempted to stop. Just like the prophet who pronounced judgment on Jeroboam's false altar and then went back to eat at the home of the old prophet in disobedience to God and then was slain by a lion. Remember, that also almost happened to Moses too. He stopped at an inn and God sought to kill him because he had disobeyed a very specific command to circumcise his son. So the lesson we learn from that is get busy, start moving. Don't stop when God tells you to go and do something. Number seven, God may tell you to do something that might not make sense to your average way of thinking. Most of us think on the average. We never set our goals or our sights above the average. We never seek to maximize the potential and the gifts that God has given to us. We find where it's comfortable and we sort of float along in the stream. And it's saying, instead of saying, God, someday I'm going to have to give an account to you. You've given me this training. You've given me these skills. You've given me this gift. You've given me these opportunities. You've put these people into my life. You've given me the, the motivation to do something, but I've sort of just sort of held back because I figured somebody else will do it. God may tell you to do something that might not make sense to your average way of thinking. God told Philip to head for Gaza. God told Moses to head for Egypt. You know where Gaza is today. You know about the Gaza Strip. The city of Gaza is the place of the administration of the Gaza Strip. It's the center of Hamas and the PLO. It is crowded today with Arab refugees. This is the place where modern Israel suffers many attacks by missiles. This has never been a nice place for nice people doing nice things. This was one of the five Philistine cities that gave constant trouble to David and to ancient Israel. Gaza was the place where Samson shut off his strength and this was the place of his humiliation. God enjoys reaching down into odd and awkward places to show forth his glory and mercy and grace. But it was not to Gaza that God showed grace. It was to someone passing through Gaza. The same was true of Moses. It was not to the desert tribes that God showed mercy and grace at the time of the Exodus. Even though Moses got his wife there. Even though he had a, a very good father-in-law, Jethro, who still lived there. God showed his grace to Israel, who had to pass through the desert. And just to make his point, God reminded Philip that Gaza is desert. God specifically says that in Acts 8. Many men of God have had to first go through a desert experience before God used them. The question is, how will we respond to the desert experience? I've had to ask myself that question over and over during the last few weeks. 
As you know, I'm going through a desert experience right now. Pray that I'll learn the lessons that God wants to teach me at this time in my life. There will always be desert experiences in the lives of God's people. I'll give you just a few. Moses kept the flock of his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the backside of the desert. They said, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert. They departed from Rephaim and were come to the desert of Sinai. And they pitched in the wilderness. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin. They were moved from the desert of Sinai and pitched at Kibrot Chatava'ah. Think of Elijah at the juniper tree. It was the desert. Think of Elijah at Mount Horeb. It was in the desert. Both of those were crisis times in the life of Elijah. Both were designed to turn Elijah's focus back to God. Both of those times showed Elijah that God cared, that God provided for him supernaturally on both occurrences and spoke to him in his time of discouragement. Desert experiences are everywhere. Don't be surprised. How often did they provoke him in the desert and grieve him in the desert? They lusted exceedingly in the wilderness God tempted and tempted God in the desert. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Matthew 3, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Matthew 3, 3, this is he which was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, which we just read a moment ago, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Matthew 4, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Matthew 14, when Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. Mark 6, and he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. And they departed into a desert place. Dear people, there are times that each one of us must go into a desert place to refocus on our service for Christ and to remember that he alone is the source of our refreshment. In a desert place there is no food. In a desert place there is no water. In a desert place there is no hustle and bustle of crowds to occupy our minds and our times and our attentions. In a desert place there is loneliness. In a desert place there is no shelter. In a desert place there is danger from the devil and the flesh. But in a desert place there is also the still small voice that Elijah heard at Mount Horeb where we can be in fellowship with God. In the desert place there may be a surprise of expanded ministry that we never expected. Philip was in a desert place. Moses and Aaron were in a desert place. Israel was in a desert place. When you're in a desert place, be alert and expectant for God to do great things. Yes, I'm going through a desert place right now. I've been pondering and searching for reasons. And I believe that one reason that God is leading me through this desert place is so that I can teach each of you something about the desert places from my heart and not merely from my head. I know the theology, but this is from my heart. But remember, desert places are not the end for those who walk by faith. They are only the end of those who rebel, who disbelieve and then die in the desert as Israel did when they rebelled ten times after the exodus. I thank God for the desert place where he is caring for me. And by the grace of God, I'm expectant that God will yet do great things because he is 
a great God. Okay, so today we've studied the first half <laughs> of the message, which is, and I'm way past time at this point, what it takes to lay a foundation for new beginnings. It takes God closing down certain things. It takes alert attention to how God is directing. It takes immediate obedience as soon as we learn what God requires the next step to be. It takes willingness to overcome our doubt about the people God wants our lives to intersect with. It takes willingness to obey one step at a time even though we do not know the end results. It takes willingness to obey God's sources of direction. Beginning with the scripture and parents, if we're still under their authority, and listen, even after their marriage, our marriage, they are still the source of wisdom and counsel even though they are no longer in control of our lives. It takes movement, not just sitting, when we know what God wants us to do. It takes, frequently, desert experiences so that we'll focus on God himself rather than on our own plans and desires. Message was entitled, Foundation for a New Beginning. Those are all essential. Next week, the Lord willing, I want to finish by examining verse 31 where the people believe the word that God gave to Moses. Believing the word of God is central to having a foundation for a new beginning. But why did the people of Israel believe at first and then fall away? What pain, and we see that says that specifically about pain, could cause them to turn back and reject the word of the living God? They did. That might give some insight into what you must diligently watch out for and avoid. Did they lose their salvation? Or at least did they lose their special relationship with God by later not believing as the text states in just a few verses? Was the believing and worship of verse 30 merely a sham and not a real manifestation of the heart? Lord willing, I hope we can cover some of those difficult questions next week. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you again for your word. Thank you for its power. Thank you that you are working in our lives, not merely watching us down here as we fumble about, but you are actively working in our lives to bring glory to Christ. And you bring us through the painful times that we might learn to trust you more, that we might learn to walk by faith, that we might learn to love you supremely above all else. Thank you, Father. You are the God who loves us and cares for us in the desert places. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn for this morning is number 305, Jesus Paid It All. We'll